Okay, hello um, and uh, welcome. Um, hi to everyone that's joining us today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, doing our second artist conversation. So uh, my name is Bryony Bond, I'm the director at the Tetley and I'm delighted today to be joined by Taos Makacheva. Uh, so hi Taos, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, Taos's exhibition at the Tetley opened uh, uh, earlier this year, so it opened in February, so quite a long time ago now, and has only just recently closed. Uh, so it closed at the end of November, uh, unfortunately, while we were closed in the second lockdown. You can still see the exhibition, however, online. So we have done a tour of the exhibition, so you can get a little sense of the show if you missed uh, an opportunity to see it in real life. Um, the exhibition was a collaboration with Liverpool Biennial, um, so thank you to Liverpool Biennial, um, and followed on from Taos's uh, uh, exhibition with Liverpool Biennial in 2018. Um, Taos has also shown with the Venice Biennale, um, the Lyon Biennale, um, and has had recent solo shows at Van Abba um, and at Moscow Museum of Modern Art. Um, so we were delighted to be able to work with her at the Tetley. Um, and today uh, we're we're just going to be talking about her work primarily that's been in the exhibition but also catching up on what Taos has been up to and future projects. Um, so Taos, the first thing I wanted to ask you actually was about um, what you've been doing this year in this very strange and difficult time and how it's affected your work and practice um, and has it made anything, has it changed your practice in any way the last couple of months? So, um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for an amazing show uh, to you and to the whole uh, team, especially to Mel uh, to, for making it possible. And to also my team as well, to Christina, Angelica, and uh, all the studio girls. Um, has it changed? Yes, I'm sort of more grounded uh, because I'm literally grounded in one place. I've uh, been able to turn uh, into more archiving, which is great for posterity or any type of posterity that uh, might come in the future, if any at all. But also, I think um, I've been increasingly thinking about uh, future feelings and skills that uh, we might need and things that uh, we might need to develop in order to live differently um, on this planet. I mean, it sounds grand, but uh, in a way it manifested in something that I'm working on right now. And I'll share uh, the presentation that I have now. So we can see a few, so we can see a few things. Great. So uh, this is, um, it's a project for France Master Real Centrum in Belgium. And I've been approached by Stijn uh, uh, with a program that they're doing called Solitude. And it's uh, basically dedicated to uh, how to experience art at home, not how to experience art from home. So kind of trying to uh, move away from constant experience through screen, but having actually something physical to encounter and to uh, work with. Uh, not work with, but experience, I think, is mm. the best word. So the project that I've proposed and that's been developing in conversation with my team and with uh, the team at the Centrum is called Mining Serendipity. And it's basically uh, a set of jewelry, but I call it um, a body -orient, set of body-oriented artifacts. And it actually comes from my mother's article who wrote uh, on jewelry and how it can constitute a different types of bodies in this world in other worlds um, that are perhaps existing in parallel reality of sorts um, so how how it forms and also how jewelry marks different liminality periods different periods of transitions so every um, piece of well let's call them charm um, is dedicated to something for example, one is dedicated to a term that comes from cyber feminism called steam engine effect, where same ideas. Steam uh, engine, what was that again, Towns? Steam engine effect. So, where similar, where the same ideas appear in the world at exactly the same time, and different people can have it. And I guess it relates to the fact that steam engine was 
uh, sort of invented in different parts of the world at the same time. Uh, then there's something called um, then there's something called something we've invented actually a term. Um, uh, distant emergency synesthesia, which is based on uh, mirror touch synesthesia. When you see someone being, I don't know, hurt or feeling something and you mirror the feelings, you feel the same way. And the sort of the, this new skill or feeling that we came up with, uh, it is meant to function through screen and through distance. So it's kind of different new ways of empathizing to other people. And for example, the actual charm related to it has an imprint of crystals that are base of uh, all the LCD screens. So it's kind of very much related to the screen, but also um, mirrors uh, feelings of people in a long distance way, um, I can say that. And then there's another one, well, I'll, I'll say just a few things, I guess, um, maybe uh, called morphic resonance. Uh, and it's also a real thing, um, or where birds, for example, they know where to fly, where to nest, where to die, even without having, uh, even without anyone teaching them. So some sort of inherent knowledge of direction. So we also have a little uh, piece dedicated to that. And you can also kind of, you know, you can form it, you can form it in any way you want. Uh, you can have a shorter chain, longer, wear one, wear three, wear seven, but I'm very cautious. It's not something that will give you these abilities. It's kind of small metaphors for, um, these uh, potential abilities uh, that might have value in the future, and I believe have value now. So this is what I've been uh, doing um, currently, um, just sort of yeah, playing with smaller things. And also, it's important that you know it's going to be sold at cost price, and it's a mini museum that you assemble yourself. That it's kind of it's it's, it's this one-on-one -on -one experience with with an artwork. And for example, one of the objects, it will be immersed in a candy. So you actually have to uh, suck it, like suck away the candy in order to access it. So it's very much about kind of embodied knowledge. And then it's it will be made from porcelain. So it actually also um, references a work of a friend of mine, Gaia Fugaza, where uh, she had uh, an artwork. It was a basically contraception pill made from porcelain and you had to hold it in your mouth during the performance. And I was very sort of mesmerized with this idea of, um, you know, um, having an encounter with an artwork with different sensory. Um, yeah, uh, senses. I guess. Pocket, with <laughs> different pocket of senses, which is your mouth, I suppose. Yeah, sorry, go on. And so how many of these will be made, Tafs? I think it's 50, but because we don't want to create, uh, uh, you know, this additional value of making it limited edition, we decided that it's going to be unlimited, unsigned, but numbered. So in case they'll be sold and the center wants to produce more, we'll make more. Great. That's you wondering. Yes. You want to order by, artworks by post, artworks by um, click and collect. Yeah, yeah. Very much that. So I guess, yes, yeah, so kind of moving away from kind of performative works and I guess, you know, I imagine that you travel a lot normally. That's kind of like, I imagine you spend quite a lot of time on a plane. So a much smaller scale, kind of intimate, more, um, I guess, kind of, uh, yeah, controlled aspect of your work possibly from lockdown. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. But it, like I think what we've also what we've everyone experienced. Well, I can't really speak for everyone, but I think one important thing is that every man, everybody met themselves, and I think this was kind of the most difficult meeting of all. Like a lot of, yeah, a lot of people had a lot of realizations of what, who they actually are, what they think, and what they want to change in their thinking. So yeah, so maybe a lot of the things became, even though they're also come like going outwards into the world and thinking about, I don't know, future of our planet perhaps. A lot of things have also concentrated on how to foster and sort of develop that inner change. But if we uh, talk about this kind of outer world and interests in the outer world that I used to have and still have and this kind of constant traveling, it's we also come to this idea of change and change through small gestures, change mm. through kind of smaller figures, um, yeah, that I've been uh, potentially interested in. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was going to kind of ask you about that because I guess in some ways these charms, you said they don't bestow powers, but they kind of hint at kind of perhaps uh, super a superpower I guess uh, and that's definitely something that your work kind of has touched on before in the past and I was kind of interested in this uh, quality that seems to have come through in in this work as well about these extra human powers that are perhaps uh, kind of maybe from the natural world like you were saying about birds migrating or about people that have particular kind of heightened abilities so the synesthesia and things like that and yeah where does that interest come from in that kind of um unusual powers i guess well i think it uh, it actually started with me traveling to to Iran in iran um oh god um in 2012 maybe i went with my friend Daria kirsanova and we to do a show there uh which she curated and I met a superhero called Super Sakrab, who was a superhero from Tehran, and um, sort of it's a persona of a curator and artist, Sohrab Kashani. And I was sort of mesmerized with it. I was mesmerized with the parallel life that that pers persona had, and I was mesmerized that you can just make some someone else into being, and that the way his persona liberated notions of masculinity, because he didn't have any superpowers, he just kind of tried, failed, tried, failed, tried, succeeded, failed, succeeded. Uh, kind of like very, just very real um, human <laughs> human functionality. And uh, and that triggered an appearance of Super Taos, actually, which uh, became an um, alter ego of mine, or she considers herself an alter ego of uh, me and her alter ego. So there's this two parallel lives constantly having, which also kind of resulted in my wider interest in uh, superheroes. And uh, another uh, project that I did with my uh, partner, uh, Sabi Ahmed, called Superhero Sighting Society, uh, which was actually exhibited, was, was exhibited <laughs> badly. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually it's actually come down now. Exactly, it's been there for a long time. Yeah, so tell tell us a bit about the Superhero Sighting Society, because um, yeah, we showed this work at the Tetley as well. So it's um, I mean it came out of uh, an invitation by Caddis Foundation, um, but initially kind of the idea was to do something with Super Taos, but it, it just felt kind of a little bit too narrow, and I wanted to expand, and plus I wanted to think wider about other superheroes about what they're doing, why they come into being, what are these kind of smaller ground up changes that people are trying to initiate, I suppose. So um, it's actually an installation uh, by the Superhero Sighting Society, which, um, which was formed at Cadist in 2019. We didn't want to go, go too much into this historicizing, into this, um, I don't know, fictional world of uh, something that we've discovered. So kind of our years, our, our dates, and it's been collecting accounts of different superheroes. And we worked together with Jessica Sagsby, who's an amazing writer, to write up different stories. And we wrote about 30 stories. And they were based on real superheroes that we found, uh, that we researched. Uh, but then they were also twisted. For example, from Britain, I think we found a superhero, Angle Grinder Man, who carries an angle grinder and kind of liberates car from these, like, I don't know, stoppage brackets. I'm not sure how they're called. So we wrote. Yeah, 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 from clamps, yes. So we wrote a story from a perception of a woman who's been given also this angle grinder and like, you know, and, and felt empowered to do the same thing. And then there was also a group called, um, no, one uh, guy which we found, I think in Bristol, called the Apostrophizer, who was removing apostrophes um, on different street signs. But we've invented the group that was anti-apostrophizer who wanted to return the unruliness to English language. So they placed them back. So kind of a lot of playful things. And for example, one of my favorites was this um, uh, superhero from Japan uh, called uh, uh, Carry Your Pram Ranger, who wore a ranger costume and helped people carry their prams, prams up the stairs on one metro station that didn't have a lift. 
So he would just constantly be there. But the story was written from a perspective of a shop, a costume shop owner who sold him that costume. But then he was very suspicious. He thought, you know, who'd want this old costume? This guy was really strange. So he was almost getting ready to identify him for police until he saw him at the train station doing this. And then he submitted his report to the Superhero Sighting Society. So it's essentially a landscape. And I think this is one of the things we were interested in when we were doing the Superhero Summit. Um, the Superhero Sighting Society and Superhero Summit, which was a symposium dedicated to superheroes, is kind of is, is looking at this landscape of these figures. Of course, we didn't want to take sort of America and, I don't know, superpowers off the American military complex and, and this idea of a hero embodying a country. We wanted to sort of stir away from that. And another element was um, were these mountains uh, and we commissioned super towers to do them. Um, and these are unclimbed mountains uh, that uh, alpine climber, climbers call last greatest problems. And well, I mean, I was quite surprised to find out that there were unclimbed mountains. Yeah. In our yes, uh, exactly. I was quite surprised. And, and then I, I spent some time in the exhibition having a look around these mountains and thinking, actually, no, it looks like a very difficult thing to get up. I couldn't see any way that you could kind of do it. Yeah. But it's quite interesting you know, looking at these impossible feats. Um, do you think, I mean, there's been a lot in the UK, I'm not sure about with you, Tavs, but there's been a lot about kind of um, heroes, local heroes um, in the UK during lockdown. And in fact, uh, there was the Stockport Spider-Man, I think, was one of the things that kind of came out where uh, just a... Um, I think it was a guy, it was actually two of them, I think, it was a guy and a mate that would kind of go on their like daily jog, taking their daily exercise in a Spider-Man costume. And then all the local kids would kind of delight in spotting Spider-Man kind of running past their, their houses. And I was kind of interested in whether, whether well, firstly, if that phenomenon has been something that you've experienced at all, um, where you've been in lockdown, um, and also if it's, if it's made you think differently about superhero sighting society or it would you want to kind of do another another version of that or yeah what's your kind of experience on it post lockdown i think I, in a way we were interested in um in the worlds that were invented and in the special abilities that were invented and in the personas that were invented we weren't that interested in things that were referenced from, like of course there's always an in, like a reference to superheroes embedded in even naming it but for example some of the heroes we found they weren't even named you know we assigned their small practice of i don't know helping people cross the road and uh, pointing kind of right directions and lifting uh, granny's bags that fall so we've in a way we've assigned the heroism to that to that so we were kind of all like we were interested in sort of this borderline um i don't know slightly invisible but but someone who's molding something new into being through their daily practice so i'm not sure about the example with the spider-man that you gave i mean i think we actually had a uh, we had one hero who was actually called by the people spider-man who saved a child in france by climbing a building and then he received a, a citizenship from the president i mean a very kind of uh, uh, murky territory who like what do you need to do in order to gain citizenship who do you need to become and we sort of mm -hmm. trying to question that um have i rethought um um, I don't know. I think kind of the heroic became much more evident in a lot of uh, in, in sort of in other fields like medicine lately. But I don't know if it would affect uh, would affect the project in a way. I don't even know if if there has to be another iteration. It's also like. You also have to let go work sometimes, you know, you, you sort of do and then you let them live and then they're specific to a certain moment because otherwise if you if you try to uh, make it contemporary all the time, it, it's just you're you're just stuck in one work. You become a one work artist that just sort of perpetually regurgitates, regurgitates, regurgitates. And I think I'm, I get too excited by uh, different things like jewelry, public art. Uh, I don't know, invisible works or, or something else or alternative lives or crazy art groups to uh, 
perpetually sort of um, chew on, on on one thing. Mm, yeah, no, I can't say that. I mean, I guess I was thinking in some ways, kind of interest in moving, or I guess in the same way that you said about assigning heroism. I think that was what I was kind of thinking about in some ways was actually like, um, there's been a lot more of that recently in kind of assigning heroism to kind of quite, you know, quite large acts of bravery, but also kind of smaller, more everyday kind of practices. Anyway, maybe maybe the superhero society, uh, sighting society, kind of encouraged that kind of uh, uh, attitude that uh, the small things should be seen as slightly more heroic. I I know I know like I hear what you're saying, but I'm also I'm not mm, too excited by claiming ownership of um, of uh, you know a, a special intuition. To, towards what the world, what's gonna happen in the world. I'm really not into this, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Fair in, enough. into see, seeing the future. Uh, but yeah, but I think it's, I think also it's a certain type of uh, attention that uh, artists uh, possess, uh, yeah, that is valuable to all of us. Definitely, but well, I think you've, you've brought up a picture um, yeah, of another work. Uh, oh, we've got Supertas is a... Uh, I think, I think I, I misplaced in my presentation. It should have been this and then the other. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, well, Supertas. So so how long has Supertas been around, Taos? Oh, God. Well, this one says 1983. So uh, it depends where, where you look at her. If you look at her in my artistic oeuvre... <laughs> <laughs> Then, then uh, let me see. Let me let me think about it. When did she appear? Yeah, I think like two thousand fourteen. I think. Uh, but if you think of this story and her perception of me and my perception of her, it's two thousand. It's nineteen eighty three when I was born. So that's when she came into existence. Um, and in a way, it's um, it's it's a parallel life that. Uh, allows me to live the life I want and her to live the life she wants. So it's kind of, it, it, yeah, it's uh, two different parallel uh, worlds that uh, enable another one to exist by existing in themselves. So could you tell us a little bit about Supertown's life story? So like, uh, and what she do? So she uh, she studied at the Dagestani State Pedagogical Institute. She lives in in Sada Mountain Village, where my uh, grandfather is from, and she works in a kindergarten there. Has a family, but was born super strong. So one of the first things that appeared uh, was this video, and we can watch a clip. And it's basically a clip from um, a clip from accidentally recorded on a dashboard camera. Thank you. 
mean, in a way, everything she does is very matter of fact. You know, she's uh, she's like just you know was on her way, gets out. So it's, she's also in a way like an homage to a lot of my relatives that just female relatives that just kind of get on with it. <laughs> they just yes, exactly. And I, I like the re the reaction of the work uh, the, the workmen in that video. They just kind of they just watch where the rock goes, and there's no kind of like. No kind of uh, questioning of uh, the incredible feat of strength that they've just been conducted. It's just like that's kind of what happens. Super Towers comes along and sorts it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of feel uh, a little bit um, troubled by the fact that, uh, uh, you know, they've acted so casually, but that if they didn't, it would have might have been a little bit over the top. <laughs> And so Taos kind of, uh, Super Taos gets on with her daily life and just kind of solves these things that just kind of crop up for her. Um, I was going to ask about the other feat of hers because she's, she's a little bit little bit of an activist, I guess, as well in some ways, in that uh, she was um, quite keen that some women were memorialised in Dagestan. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like you're referring to Untitled 2 that I'll show in a second, but I think this is also like the, the portrait that we're seeing now relates very much to Super Towns. It's actually not my work, um, but my one of my favorite works called Cosmic Mother by Galina Knapaska from 1970s. And to me, it's kind of this really incredible image of a woman cosmonaut and pot empowered, you know, during like Cold War with the baby. Like it's just it's just an incredibly powerful painting and then also in a way predecessor of Super Taos of sorts. Mm -hmm. Like her, her cosmic, uh, I don't know, spiritual mother if I can use that word. But in terms of the work that uh, the untitled two, another thing that she did, which and it's also important because she doesn't call them works, she refers to them as life-affirming practices. So she found out about a, about an attempted theft of a Russian abstract composition from one of the Dagestani museums that you see on the screen here. And she, and then the theft was prevented by two museum invigilators, Maria Karkmasova and Khamisat Abdullaeva, who were just sort of women in their 40s and 50s. And one of them, Khamisat, she saw um, a thief uh, that cut out the frame, the painting from a frame, uh, like empty frame, and told the other invigilator, and the other one ran after her, after him, and snatched it back. So kind of, you know, we're not talking, it's like 90s, we're not talking crazy museum security, we're like literally talking just invigilators and one security guy. And these women, and, I, and I'm really, I was really drawn, and Supertimes was really drawn to this kind of impulse of not think of anything else but kind of save the artwork and actually after this uh, work uh, one museum worker from moscow came up to me unfortunately i didn't get her name but she told me a story how um a museum collection keeper they weren't called keepers uh, curators in the soviet times they were called collection keepers mm -hmm. uh, she saw like a, a statue falling and she ran to grab it and I'm thinking like what like it's it's marble or it's like granite it's super heavy and like what makes you forget that you, like it's like it's incredible like I think it's it's pretty the impulse is pretty incredible so she wanted to create the two uh, the monument uh, obviously large scale bronze tall in the main square to Khamisat and Maria but then she kind of created a smaller version and took it into different institutions uh, around the world. She took it to Pompidou, and we're gonna watch a short clip. She took it to um, a Moscow Museum of Modern Art. She walked around it in Dagestan, trying to find a good space for it. And then uh, fourth attempt, fourth video was her walking by foot, carrying this bronze uh, monument on her back from Hichkala um, to Moscow for 10 days. But yeah, let's just watch a short one of the clips. Thank you. 
She does, really, she does a really good matter of fact install as well, Taos. Like uh, she just carries it in on her back, puts it in exactly. the gallery, job done. Exactly, exactly. And and I she did the same thing at the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. And we can watch a short clip from the her um, walk uh, around in Kachkala, uh, if you think. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It's just yeah, you know, Lenin Square with the Lenin in the square, and then the museum where that thing is actually happened. And it's all shot with like different phone cameras, you know, and then sort of assembled together for that documentary feel as well. Did someone start helping her though? Hmm? Did someone just jump in and start helping her? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, I guess, you know, there's kind of lots to kind of think about with Supertas really in in the way that she operates, um, but also I guess in, in what she's doing. Um, what was she, what did she want to achieve by uh, kind of moving the sculpture around and uh, did she want to achieve its permanent home or recognition of these particular women or or this deed that had happened and that maybe wasn't quite so well known? What did she want to kind of accomplish? Well, I'd, I'd say it wasn't known at all because there was no, you know, no bonus from the museum. There was no, even the papers that we found at the time, they all said that the mem members of the police prevented the theft. And uh, there was no mention of their names. And I actually was lucky because I got to speak to one of them, to Hamasat. I mean, unfortunately she passed away before I decided to do the work, uh, but I had like a short interview with her when I found out about the story. So it was, yeah, it's, it's kind of making visible certain labor, making visible that uh, situation, making visible that impulse, I guess, that I was, which was incredibly, important and which is a result of um, of a certain it is a result of certain ideology you know um, and um, also so it's I guess it's showing different uh, different faces of, of reality that we're living in and also it's, you know kind of addressing a question of there are the fact that you know there are not too many monuments to real particular specific women in Dagestan there's very a lot of monuments to specific men but then to women it's like this you know, the woman teacher, kind of to all the teachers that would come from, uh, you know, Soviet Union, Moscow universities that were allocated to teach in mountain villages in Dagestan, and generally kind of in rural and uh, urban areas. So there are these kind of women, uh, imaginary collective image of women, but kind of specific ones, much less. So it's that, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I guess it's uh, a lot of things, uh, but I think I'm very drawn to just different types of visibilities um, and collecting different uh, stories and different artifacts, uh, shine, sometimes very shiny artifacts uh, and sharing that excitement about the shine of the artifacts. I guess as well, I think there's, there's also you know, there's something I'd like to pick up on public sculpture, which I think maybe we might return to again, but just on Supertas as well, I mean, I guess, you know, she's dressed in Dagestani traditional, um, well, clothing, it's not it's not costume, is it? It's kind of just day-to-day -day clothing. And I guess in the gallery that you're kind of, that Supertas is essentially kind of working in, kind of moving this sculpture around and installing, someone wearing that costume isn't always seen, I'm assuming, certainly not Sandra Pompidou, possibly not in the, gallery of modern art uh, in Moscow and is, is that also 
how that's kind of seen in those different spaces, how that's yeah. recorded. Yeah, no, of course, that, that's, a, that's a very good, uh, uh, good point that you're making. And um, like, of course, it's, it's a certain persona, but it's also this thing, this very naive, she, she's quite naive, I, I, I must say, um, very naive belief that you can just walk into a canon, that you can just walk into a certain history of art and place something there. So it's kind of, it's, it's complete, uh, completely not knowing the language, but believing that it's yours. The space is also yours. And I think it's, it's actually quite similar to one of the very early performances that I did. I think it's one of my first in, I don't know, maybe 2003 or something, when I walked into Tate Modern in Turbine Hall and, and around Tate with big sandwich boards that said, I want my show at Tate Modern with my CD at the back. So it's kind of, it's exactly about this, not knowing an institutional language, but having the, I don't know, some sort of crazy ambition or idea. And I remember actually my, one of my teacher, uh, actually no, it was Gail Pickering. I remember exactly who was it at my BA at Goldsmith asking me, so but what would you show? I was like, oh, I would show that performance. Like if you were offered, you know, right now the, the show at Tate. I was like, oh, I would show this performance. And then I was like, oh, and some documentary photography that I have. But obviously I had nothing to show. Like <laughs> there was no, there, there was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a work about not knowing the language of access. Um, mm. I suppose. So in a way she's similar. She, she's, she's, um, she's also fiddling with that uh, language. I think, yeah, as well, I guess, you know, the benefit of having an alter ego is to kind of, be able to kind of behave in that way that is actually quite liberating and kind of sidesteps that kind of um, accepted practice of behaviour within within the art. So you know, I can kind of see the attraction of the alter ego. Um, I, I know that we'll probably return to public culture as a something we want to kind of discuss. I mean, um, it's interesting that uh, really recently in the UK, I don't know if you heard about it, there was a public monument to Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, and there was a very heated debate about the resulting sculpture that came from it. Um, it was by Maggie Hamling, and it was essentially a, a, a naked woman. Um, and, and there were lots of kind of comments about. And it was also also interestingly, you know, they talked about it being a universal woman rather than uh, necessarily a particular individual. And there were lots of there was a lot of backlash on this, you know lots of people on. Um, you know, responding about, you know, why hasn't this person you know, been actually remembered for what she did and why did it have to kind of represent everyone? And also, you know, fundamentally, why has she not got any clothes on? Um, but it was, it, it kind of, um, you know, public sculpture, I guess, that gets people heated in a way that, and obviously the recent kind of um, toppling of sculptures in the UK in response to Black Lives Matter and are rethinking a, a lot about public sculpture it's it's something that really you know demonstrates the fact that it still has power that people are still very um, it's not it's not a power that's diminished I would say um, and I, I was wondering about um, I guess I was kind of thinking around public sculpture in that way that I know you've kind of started to look at um, and did you find a permanent home for your sculptures or are they uh, it, it was never meant to be found. That's like like she was she was always meant to be unsatisfied with uh, with all the potential spots. So it's now it's somewhere in her storage. And the way I show the her life affirming practice is just for screens of these attempts. So yeah, uh, I think it, it was never meant to find a place, which is potentially a little bit depressing. Uh, but I but also like I think we have to remember that. You know, in the UK and I don't know, France or Europe, public sculpture occupy a very different place. They are, I don't think they're such living, such living symbols of sort of memory and reality. I think uh, as they are in, uh, in Russia, I think like in Russia, there's still an aspiration to become a monument. And I don't think in, in the UK there is that aspiration that, I don't know, writers have or people have. I think, yeah, in Russia, like, it's a still thing that certifies towards 
something. So it carries a very different meaning. Um, yeah. Mm, I mean, I guess it's, it's very, or at least kind of people have commemorated it are uh, more historical. And I guess the kind of reflection at the moment is about are we are we reflecting the right people in history? Are we actually kind of telling a full story? Yeah, like in a way, I understand the debate, but I'm I'm really generally not a fan of constant erasure, because like I I come from a country that likes to erase and build a new, erase and build a new, erase and build a new, and I'm really in love with the project that uh, Anina Anina Nenya did. And about uh, in about this real thing that happened in Algeria. I think it, it was a monument um, commissioned uh, and built by the French uh, to soldiers of the, I think, First World War. And then uh, another artist has been commissioned much later to hide that monument and, and sort of and build something over it. And he just he decided not to destroy it because I think the destruction was also on the cards. So he just built another sculpture around it. And at some point it gave a crack. So you can see the, the other one, the newer monument and the other monument inside of it. Um, and kind of she did a whole project about this history of like trying to, you know, contain one monument and another doing some sort of Russian doll. So I'm I'm really I was really mesmerized of how you can build something on top of the other, how you can, you know, I don't know, have one president in another president in another president, I don't know, modify these constant Lenin squares into something else. And, and, and there's something in that containment or something in that rethinking that is much more valuable than just taking it to, uh, to a park with uh, derelict and abandoned uh, political mm. past. No, interesting. Very interesting on those kind of different, um, yeah, different experiences across the world of that public monument. Um, but, but yes, uh, let's turn to the Unbound, which is here actually. Um, it'd be really great, uh, yeah, to talk a little bit about this this particular work, Taos. I mean, I guess I'm very interested in it, um, particularly in your relationship to to Dagestan, um, and. Yeah, how did this come about? Was it was it something you, you were kind of working on for a long time, or I know it's a collaboration, isn't it, with a wider group? So it's it actually happened. Uh, it happened in two thousand fifteen. The, the project for the first time, and actually this was the second exhibition at the Tashi, and I'm so grateful uh, you guys were up for it because it hasn't seen much uh, much much light and hasn't met a lot of gaze, and. Um, it was, it, it, it's a, well, it's anonymous, but basically it's me and my friend Andrei Mzian, who's also a curator, and uh, more people, Nikita Dmitriev, Gleb Berg wrote amazing texts for it and kind of did a lot for the project. Farhad Farzali, Ilyas Hadri, whose projects are presented separately, not as part of this anonymous group. And I think it also relates to methodology um, that I'm particularly excited by, and kind of, and, it's much more to the core of how I start usually my projects, but as myself, I develop them very differently. They become kind of this larger, gentler metaphors. And here the kind of the, the metaphor happened through text and through description. So I don't know, in this image that you see, unfortunately this large object didn't travel to Tetley, but this was done with the, um, with a famous uh, furniture maker in Dagestan. And we asked him to create a collage of the most desired objects in the most desired style that he could think of. And we ended up with this kind of strange curtain cupboard, you know, uh, through more painting, kind of strange uh, um, insect of, of sorts, but as an illustration of kind of desired Baroque, uh, Baroque uh, style. And there were other things that were collected when I was kind of thinking about the sparkly thing, these Uggs boots with Chanel logo that um, very much just were left as a symbol now because like it's an, it's an, unimaginable, an unimaginable thing. And um, these shoes, which were also made by local shoemakers on with our sketches with kind of very elongated noses. And that was a trend at some point in 2000 uh, that kind of men in the Caucasus would wear like these shoes with super long noses. And Andre wrote a beautiful text where he spoke about the fact that um, this elongated nose was a leftover, so sort of like 
at, at Adi, some, some, yeah, some sort of leftover uh, from the union between the rider and a horse, between a warrior and his horse, because they would allow him to sit and hold on in stirrups much better. So this is this longing or cry for your abandoned war for yourselves. So a lot of the things, and one thing, I won't show it today, but there was one video that I, there were two videos that I'm particularly fond of, uh, that I one was yeah uh, that I filmed about with a guy with a friend of mine who was biting an ice cream um, because you know kind of it, it was sort of a pun on the fact that men on the Caucasus can't lick they only bite even with ice cream and then there was another video that was uh, that I accidentally basically filmed in the car I called a taxi once in Hichikala and the guy had two window uh, shields two glass windows. Um, it was like a double. One was uh, tinted and another one was completely clear because uh, according to law, you can't have tinted windows. But, you know, when you're partying or hiding somewhere in the mountains, uh, making out or, or something else, you know, you need to tint up. So whenever he passed police, it was a clear glass. But then it, so it's but it's like, you know, it comes from my crazy excitement and admiration for the flexibility that, that, that you invent in these daily practices and how they can unpick something larger that is happening. So yeah, I think Unbound can be described as that. So in a way it's, it's, it, it is this um, fascination with the daily that erupts into something bigger, but approached from a very different um, perspective. But kind of, I guess, similar to what Supertown's does is that it's just that her focus is on something else, similar to what I do, yeah. So, I mean, I guess they're kind of like, they're in some ways, they're a bit of an, an ethnography. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, because he's an anthropologist, Andre. So they're very, like, there is this anthropological sort of ethnographic angle of trying to rethink and trying to remap, uh, well, actually, maybe trying to even put on the map this flexibility um, and not kind of constantly perceiving uh, Caucasus as the other. So mm. it's, it's, yeah. It's owning, uh, owning something else. Did you want to show a video from Unbound or was it? I think we have, I think we have a couple of more works and uh, it's... Uh, oh yes, it's, we're kind of, yeah, we're going to talk about something. <laughs> I think we're a bit behind. So Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of just chatting. I'm just enjoying it now, but yes. Um, yeah, we were going to talk about a little bit about Gamsuto, which I guess in, in some ways kind of carries this on. I mean, interestingly, um, when I was uh, Googling Bagastan Taos, this is the image that comes up. I don't when, know. You, when you're what? Say it again. If you Google Dagestan, oh. the image of Gamsuto is one of the things, is one of the kind of key images that actually kind of comes up when you're actually kind of looking for it. That's that's good. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, Gamsutal is is the name of the village that we're looking at. Yeah, and it's uh, so I actually initially saw an image of this village in a photograph by Zurgalov, this very good photographer who traveled a lot in Dagestan, and it was in 2011, I think. And at the time, uh, I decided to go there. I also spoke to a local historian, Fitzmat Dachnaeva, because she's been there. And she interviewed the only uh, guy that used to live there at the time, Abdul Jalil, Abdul Jalil. And I went and I met him. And it was, um, it was, it was very interesting. I mean, he, he was kind of an incredible mind. He had bees on his balcony, which he chatted to, listened to radio, and wanted to make there like uh, a, a sort of a very interesting... Uh, a very interesting kind of ecological park. That's what he kind of decided. That's what he kind of imagined this place being. And he moved back in, uh, I think, the 90s uh, because he had an argument with his uh, relatives about the, the flat that they were living in. But maybe that's irrelevant. Um, but the fact that he was living there alone and I guess the whole architecture gave me this idea of... Um, thinking about a space and thinking about enacting history of a space, of a place through choreography. 
Um, and through different things, because it was basically kind of the way it was built on the rocks, it was uh, to use uh, the farmlands for farming, whatever kind of flat lands uh, there were. Uh, and also kind of as a, as a protection, as a kind of a military protection uh, site that is kind of, you see everyone who's approaching and it's super high up and it's very well, uh, it functions very well from a uh, war perspective, I suppose. And then I, uh, I met a choreographer, Anya Balikhina, and we started thinking like, what can it be? And, you know, I brought her a ton of, uh, you know, printouts of uh, war paintings from the Dagestan Museum of Fine Art and the historical museum of Dagestan. I was like, how can we turn this into a dance? Like, can we do something about it? And she turned it into a dance. And it, there's actually a few uh, segments of the work um, that is uh, that uh, are based on different uh, themes. One is this first part, which is based on war, uh, war paintings of the Great Caucasian War when Dagestan became part of Russia. And he mimics movements of both the Russian Imperial Army and the Highlanders Army. And then the second part is based on a dance of a collective farm brigade leader, because everyone was moved from that village and a lot of other high mountain villages into these collective Soviet farms in the 60s and 70s um, in order to build a better future, I suppose, and uh, farm better lands. And also, you know, once you, um, you want to remap the roads and you want to remap the... Um, remap the living conditions and move people uh, once kind of the land becomes your own uh, in a way. And then the third uh, fragment of the video, third part of it is based on kind of my contemporary thinking of relationship to ruin and relationship to a place and connection to a place that you might occupy. And we can watch short excerpts uh, from the video. Oh, sorry, I don't know what I've done there. There's a short exit to see something. Uh, sorry, I wanted to scroll, but it didn't work out okay. the way that I planned. Just give me one second. Sure. And were you saying that there was actually someone that was still living in the village at the time that you yeah. were filming this? Yes, exactly. Uh, I think it's back, maybe. Can you, can you see now? I'm, I'm still screen sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Sorry, uh, you you said yes. There was so Abdul Jalil was there alone. I don't know for maybe ten years. I mean, unfortunately now he passed away. Um, but then maybe it's good because there's a crazy flow of tourists at the moment. You know, <laughs> when we when we went up, we he's he once told me it's like oh we had a very busy summer. You know, I had like three groups visit. Now I think when I went up this summer, I had maybe I saw about sixty people on the way uh, up and down. Wow. So really, yeah, it's really uh, a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's great that the, the space gets experienced, but I guess it wouldn't be so quiet for him. Uh, I, so this I was kind of interested in that, actually, in, the, in your work about the relationship between, um, not, it's not a nostalgia, but a kind of um, a, a memory or a kind of perhaps um, uh, imagined idea of a Dagestani past and then um, and how that kind of um, meets a kind of present reality I guess in some ways and that and I, I think the unbound and maybe Gamsutal is a little bit about that and I, I was wondering about how is that does that, is that kind of a mirror about your kind of personal experience of Dagestan or how do you how do you experience Dagestan yourself? Mm. Um, I like this, what you say about imagined idea, because I also collect a lot of mm, seemingly crazy stories and try to make, uh, try to make up uh, confirmations for them. Uh, when I was doing research for Tightrope, I've, uh, one of the Tightrope walkers we interviewed said that, oh, you know, like ancient times, our uh, you know, forefathers used to put a tightrope between two mountains and walk, uh, so it would be shorter to walk between them. And I would, uh, and uh, once I did a, a silk screen print where the actual photograph was sort of, it was photoshopped, but it was exactly this, like a tiny tightrope, a tiny tightrope walk between two mountains. So I really like this imaginary, imaginary history, an imaginary idea or imagined memory. How do I experience it? Um, I don't know, in a way, in a way through fascination to these imagined histories. And at some point it becomes, uh, is at some point facts also become irrelevant uh, because you sort of immerse yourself into stories of people that surround you. 
Um, so I, I do experience it a lot through imagination of people around me, I would say, and people that I meet there. Um, this may be one thing, but then I guess experiencing actual nature is very different. It's, it's sort of, it's very, yeah, it's just kind of very personal and, and uh, fortifying experience uh, to yourself. That's, yeah. Thanks, Taos. I think um, we said we'd open up to questions at one o'clock, but I know we wanted to talk a little bit about ASMR Spa. So uh, actually, what is the painting that we have up on screen at the moment? Did you want to mention that? This is, uh, this is a painting uh, by Franz Rougeau, and this is exactly one of the paintings that were reference work for his dance in the beginning of the film when we see the full panorama of Ram Sutra. But then again, it's it's such an image of romanticized war. It's nothing close to anything factual in a way. And you can't actually tell whose side the artist was on. He was commissioned by the um, imperial um, army. But then, yeah, it's still a big question. Well, maybe it doesn't even matter. And then, so these are just the references for Gamsutra. And that's also often how I work. So this is the dance of a collective farm brigade leader that I mentioned that the second part is based on because the middle history and the history of this abandonment was is very recent. It's We're talking like 1960s, 1970s when people were moved into these collective farms. So it became so, it crumbled very quickly. It crumbled within like, I don't know, 40 years, uh, so much. Um, I mean, it's, it's the architectural builds and kind of without people, you know, the moisture is not pushed out after the rain. So it, it, it's, yeah, it relates to that. But uh, yeah, so those three parts. We can we can go back to, yeah, last work that we wanted to touch upon that kind of actually served as a catalyst to our meeting and to, <laughs> in Liverpool in 2018. Yeah, exactly. Yes, this is the new work that you created for Liverpool Biennial, wasn't it? That we also showed, and was the, the kind of linchpin of the, the partnership with Liverpool Biennial. Um, and I mean, it's. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about how this came about? Because I mean, it was quite, it was quite closely related to the venue, wasn't it, in Liverpool, in which it was shown? Yeah, yeah. It's um, so I was invited uh, by Sally and Kitty, and we went to. I went and I was taken to different places, and I was really mesmerized with Blackburn House, who uh, is an education education center for women, and used to be the first um, school for girls in Liverpool. And at some point, it was also sort of closed down, abandoned. And when it was reopened uh, to become this education center, there was there were shards of sculpture that was found at the entrance. And actually, I saw a photograph of this sculpture, and it was like three muses or something like that—a copy of three muses. This sort of Greek, uh, classical Greek uh, theme, I suppose. And um, and I talked to Brenda, who was a deputy director, and she told me a lot of interesting things. And one thing I remembered quite well was that, you know, when women go to study by the mid-year, by Christmas, they hit something that they refer to as the brick wall. You know, when they kind of feel that they're failing, they can't deal with homework, kids are ill at school, and they usually send someone when they feel kind of the woman kind of is, is um, not coping too well and might drop the studies to kind of help her go through that wall, through that brick wall, on to have her move on through that brick wall. So I, I, it was a very kind of gentle space and a space of repair and a space of potentially repairing those sharded sculptures or faces or, or, or selves uh, uh, in, from different situations. And at the time, I just did a work for Read the Biennial, and it was very much about slowness, slowing down, different perception of time. And I was interested in ASMR videos because to me, there were uh, these very interesting um, simulations of uh, uh, simulations of um, connection or intimacy through the screen, and it was incredibly like uh, it was incredibly interesting how why they were so popular. I'm sure they're even more popular now. And actually, that was the point when I find out when I found out about mere synesthesia from Michael Banasi who worked at the psychology department at Goldsmith and actually Liverpool Biennial set up a meeting for it. So, which carried on into this jewelry right now. 
So a lot of things, I think, emerged from that work and kept on being reworked. And there were several elements to the work. Um, there was a sculptural installation, which was done by Alexander Kutavoy, this amazing colleague of mine, amazing artist. And basically what he did and what we sort of experimented with together, he took a head, sort of this Greek uh, classical head uh, that students uh, usually study and, and you know, test draw from an art schools and he kept breaking it and then when we saw the pieces that would fit our idea we then later kind of he made copies and made them into this large sculpture so you see kind of you can make out a cheek a bit of hair a bit of neck and then it was very interesting how he spoke about surfaces you know this particular sculptural element of the work had three types of surfaces the prehistoric which was this kind of stone uh, surface and then the ancient being the kind of Greek cheek. And then the, he called it Euro renovations uh, surface, which, you know, when you tr when in the 90s, you would kind of renovate your home. You would kind of try to do it sleek, but fail. So then there's a little bit of failure uh, in that surface, uh, embedded in that surface. And I've never actually kind of uh, worked with someone or actually heard someone speak so conceptually about materiality, but maybe it's just my lack of uh, awareness of the way sculptors work. So this was one element. And another element, there was a, there was a facial that you could book uh, and the beautician narrated a story written by David McDermott, um, who's this incredible writer who at the time was based in Liverpool. And the story retells a story, retells her story, the beautician's story, the story of her skill, the story how somebody came to do this facial and he was an art restorer and he came because he wanted to feel what his paintings felt when he was restoring them. And she talked about mere synesthesia, the fact that she has it, about empathy, about the works that have been left after uh, other Liverpool biennials in the city. And if you couldn't book an actual facial, uh, you you could watch the video, the ASMR video that we recorded where the story would be audible and all the, the sounds of kind of things being applied to your face, washed off, crinkled, brushed, would also be uh, audible. There was one more element that I want to mention that would take just a few more minutes is that we developed a special line of beauty products for it with the uh, Tsigran from 2211 in Moscow. And this was a very interesting. I mean, I love this kind of, it became a conceptual spot, potentially my alternative career. So we've, uh, we had different products based on different sculptural processes. Um, there was a clay cleanser, metal infused toner, scrub with mineral granite, wood massage oil, and then a mat plaster mask that you would remove and leave an imprint. And then the last thing was that was cream, uh, where main ingredients were linseed uh, oil and cotton extract. And it's basically, if you try to make a moisturizing cream out of an oil painting, that's what you'll get. So kind of you go through this molding, kind of through these stories and kind of absorb a painting and leave. Well, hopefully transformed in some way, but uh, yeah, that, that is not for me to say. So yeah. Briefly, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the one. It's quite a great, in some ways, it's quite a good simulation of your of your practice as well. And, it, you know, it, it kind of touches on lots of things from, uh, yeah, restoration, conflating the body and the art object, you know, that you are this kind of broken art object being restored by a beautician slash conservator. Yeah. You know, there's, there's lots of things, and I guess in a way, you know, the performance um, that becomes part of the work as well. So, yes, I can see that I think the ASMR Spawn is actually a really good summation of lots of the areas of interest in your work. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we've been asked actually online um, so that we, we actually kind of uh, bring in some of the voices. Um, and they're really great questions, actually. Um, I'm going to start off with the first uh, one that's on my screen is um, how uh, can you explain how the exhibition name Hold Your Horses came about? Which is <laughs> a good point, and I forgot to ask you that. Um, where does the name come from, Taz? Oh, I need to open my notes. <laughs> uh, I need to remember. So I think, well, first of all, I like uh, playful names, uh, playful exhibition names, and I think it was. Um, in, I think it was in relation to patients 
uh, different timing and different and holding back uh, sort of first uh, mm, intuitive, no, not intuitive, knee jerk judgments. Yes, let's put it that way. So, so I think it was, it was about that. It was kind of like, you know, giving time to give it time. <laughs> Let's see. Um, but I think also it, it somehow ended up relating to Tetley as well and how it used to function. I think Mal told me, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Is that around the horses? The, uh, yes. Yeah, so, yes, they used to be dray horses that used to take deliveries of beer around the, the city. And I mean, well into the. 90s and I think even into the 2000s that those horses were still used because it was such a kind of um, symbol I think of the company that they kind of they couldn't really get rid of them I think they tried to get rid of them at one stage and there was like a huge influx of letters to the Yorkshire Post and so yeah the horses became synonymous with the technic brand in the city so <laughs> so yes, I guess yeah, horses certainly have been kind of part of the history of the building. Yeah, I mean that's that that's a far off connection, but, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy with it. But it's like you know, kind of I had a show recently and um, a house of media art in oh God, well, house of media art in Germany, um, and the sh show ended up being called uh, Sturdy Black Shoes. And it was actually from an essay by Uzma Rizvi on my work. And this was something that related to Super Towns' attire and, you know, the way she dealt with patriarchy and kind of this kind of stepping over. So, so it's and like, and it, and it relates to wider unpacking and, and pushing boundaries of the body and of, the, well, patriarchy's masculinities as well. Yes, great. I think there were quite some comments as well in the, about it being, you know, this idea of patience and uh, kind of status also being something that kind of felt quite relevant in the subsequent time when it was kind of locked down and doors were shut on the show and then you kind of had to wait to kind of get back and things like that. So it ended up, I think it was also, Taos, I think the longest running show we've ever had at the Technion, I think, without a doubt. Not the biggest footfall, but the longest. <laughs> yes, um, So, yeah, so in some ways it starts to take on another resonance as well of uh, patience. Um, the other question we've been asked is, um, how did you approach curating your work in the Tetley's gallery spaces? Were there any challenges you faced or any works you think worked well in the space? Uh, maybe you want to tell about our first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I can't remember in what context else. I mean, I showed you around the spaces because it is such a unique gallery space. Uh, and it is always, it presents opportunities and it presents challenges, definitely, with exhibiting any work. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, how, what was your response to the space? So uh, I think we laid out the show like almost completely in the first meeting. <laughs> yeah, very productive. It, it was very one of my first visits. But of course, things moved around a little bit. And then, oh, we had, oh, we wanted to bring the aerostatic exper uh, experience. There was this work of this giant balloon, which we wanted the whole atrium to occupy, but that didn't work out due to some certain limitations. Um, but yeah, we laid it out quite quickly and it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was very difficult. I mean, it's, um, mm, because it's such a beautiful space, uh, like kind of really, and I, and I love placing works in spaces that are filled with something. I'm not, I mean, I work easily in black, in, in black cubes, in white cubes, and in, in spaces that are filled with, uh, I don't know, historical pan paneling uh, or histories. Uh, and um, I think it was, it was kind of an easy layout, but then, um, and also kind of, I liked that it allowed some migrations for things. And I'm on, like, I'm only referring to this inflatable balloon, which we were able to inflate at the opening, uh, kind of in the, uh, in the exactly in the staircase, so it would block things, and then it would be inflated in the boardroom. So I like this sort of uh, this one element that would sort of keep migrating 
I mean, generally, superhero sightings society installed is a bit of a challenge, uh, which Christina dealt with very well because it's all the mountains are formed by hand, and you know, kind of, there were other things uh, because we wanted the floor to be less shiny, so we ended up like kind of buffing it so that it would be more matte. So there are a lot of things also that uh, Mel had to. Uh, had to deal with and, and a lot of things that we that came into being that were yeah that have been discussed. Sorry, I'm just rumbling right here. I don't I don't I'm not sure I can say a lot of things of the value. Um, yeah, okay, shiny floor was a challenge. Uh, what else? Uh, not much else <laughs> that I can remember. Us uh, worked well in the space. Um, wow, I might I like I might yeah. come as very arrogant artists say that like if I say that everything worked well. Um, yeah, it's just like I think. Yeah, I think it worked fine. Like everything worked fine. I don't. I didn't feel that things were didn't work, or and we came up with some great solutions for the new rules of the pandemic with numbers for the unbound like <laughs> unbound uh, cards. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll stop. It's that, that's no, it. I mean, I think that's it is interesting. I mean, I think it's in some ways. I think the space isn't always suited to everyone's work, but actually, the way that you work. Um, with these kind of distinct projects moving from room to room actually enabled projects to inhabit a complete space themselves uh, and then for you to kind of see the connection between them which is quite good I mean yeah the technical team though I often say at at least we don't have to build any walls I've spent lots of time in previous galleries building lots of walls and at the technical it's something we have plenty of so it's a very good way of showing lots of distinct projects um, quite easily um but yes I'm, I'm glad it didn't cause any particular challenges but as you say the big inflatable balloon it's the challenge with our particular atrium is that it's a great volume of space but the ceiling is is not able to take any weight really so we can't we can't hang things very easily from that space at all it's just not it's not possible the great 1930s flat roof with skylights in which is kind of beautiful but yes it's not built it's not built to hang things from unfortunately maybe paper sculpture one day you know somebody will make something ginormous out of paper and that would be able to hold <laughs> i hope we so have done, we have done inflatable sculptures before in that space that's worked quite well okay. <laughs> but yes it's kind of tricky um, someone else asked, uh, what were the mountains made of? And how did you compile and select the printed imagery for them? So the mountains were made of, on top it was canvas and, and image printed on canvas. And uh, inside there was, there are two ways of making it. There, it's either enforced like thicker aluminum foil or like a, it's a metal mesh that you glue to the canvas and then another canvas on top. Like if you're like really want a technical yeah. sandwich with sort of metal and forest, either mesh or um, foil. Uh, imagery, so basically the research for Superhero Sighting Society uh, was done by my amazing uh, project manager who I worked with at the time, Andrei Yefitz. So he researched uh, all the unclimbed mountains and then we looked at them at Google Maps and we're like, oh, does this look pretty enough? Is this like, is this high enough? Uh, so basically, so we selected, it's actually not that many unclimbed. So we selected several and then I think he found somebody who was able to take sort of very high res resolution uh, images from Google Earth, like, and put them together in some way. And that, so like, so are these, they are like these screenshots of uh, aerial views, but I'm not sure what type of software they had. And then they stitched them together and we had this kind of print. So they should be quite accurate, but then formed by hand. So I wouldn't say they were like exactly, exactly correct. But close enough, just like the myth I collect, you know, it's close enough, everything is close enough. Yeah, I was thinking they'd be great kind of devices for mountaineers wanting to make a name for themselves, that they could kind of walk amongst your uh, maquettes and work out which one they could possibly do. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like I just wanted people to put their hand on top, and, you know, and climb it. This was the this was a big enabling of actually climbing all of these peaks. That's great. Um, I was going to ask you actually, tell us about. Um, what's coming up next um, and what are you what are you kind of working on at the moment and and what's next for yourself and possibly for Super Towers? what have you got coming up 
oh, I don't know, Super Taz is pretty busy with her kindergarten work and family, so there's not much coming out from her. I'm currently doing my first public art uh, commission. And it's actually something for a small square in front of a residential building. And I'm quite excited because I've never done anything like that before. And basically I'm just making a ginormous minerals and crystal sculptures. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's, some, it's, it's in a way it's a portrait of different layers of the earth combined into these uh, mineral, beautiful, sparkly, uh, things that have different origins uh, embedded in them. So, so no figures, no figurative public art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, then there's a big show which I'm quite excited about at the Fries Museum in Duarden in Netherlands. And they're bringing, they're bringing our static experience. So I'm very happy about that. that they're gonna hang the balloon uh, in their atrium. And they're also bringing this work that I really love, Shadivari, which is also kind of a super large. Uh, so that's gonna uh, open in March and it's gonna be on for 12 months. And I've never heard, had like a museum show run for 12 months. So I'm very excited because kind of these large works will be there for a long period and, you know, uh, hopefully people will be able to see them and experience them in some way. That's great. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I like the idea of um, a public artwork that isn't figurative. That sounds quite exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. But yeah, I'm not sure if I have anything else to say, but what is next for uh, for you, Bryony, and for Tetley? Oh gosh, well, the next show we've got coming up is an exhibition by Mel Brimfield. Uh, and it's called um, From This World to That Which Is to Come. Uh, so, yes, it's uh, it's quite an interesting show, uh, exhibition around uh, Mel um, Mel's family experience of um, ill men mental health, actually, so around psychosis in particular. So it's quite a, quite a different exhibition to yours. Um, but yeah, Mel often works with video and with humour actually. So she's she often kind of also takes a humorous kind of look at some of these quite difficult subject areas and quite personal subject areas as well. Um, and by bringing a little element of humour to them, actually finds a different way uh, into them and to talking about yeah quite difficult subject areas. So in some ways, you know, a kind of similar kind of take on things to you really around humour. Amazing. I mean, actually, the humor in your work because there is a lot, isn't there? Really, in in the way that you kind of actually approach things, and it's not it's not all done completely seriously. I mean, they are they are funny. You know, actually, super talent moving the boulder off the road is done in a very matter of fact way, but it's extremely it's really funny, and just the kind of uh, humor of um, superpowers moving these huge objects. This on, you know, on the unexpected, you know, unexpected kind of uh, feats of strength and things like that. And yeah, what's your what's your response to humor in your work? I think it's, but it's also it's it's this thing of like hold your horses in a way, like it relates to this because I'm very interested in this first laughter that you make, kind of uh, almost instinctively, like it's super tense, but then sort of like, oh, what am I laughing at? Like, what exactly am I laughing? And the same thing with Unbound, and the same thing with like a lot of other projects. It's like what is this, what is this that makes me laugh? Um, so I think it's this little point uh, that to me is um, one of the most important points in perceiving um, artworks. So to kind of make that kind of reflective space, so you actually reflect on something just taking it as a kind of funny one-liner, it's that kind of moment afterwards that you reflect on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, just right there and then, but uh, maybe after is also fine. <laughs> no, I think it's um, yeah, it's very true actually. Yeah, the kind of humor is is uh, it is it, a reflective humor. It's something that makes you kind of yeah look at yourself as well, rather than just kind of yeah finding it outright funny. It's a it's a kind of quiet, reflective humor in your work. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure having your show for such a long time. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you um, 
have the longest running show at the Tetley. <laughs> wow, Guinness Book of Records. I might pitch it, you know. Um, we have too many records coming up. But thank you so much, Riley, and thank you to everyone. Thank you to Mel, and thank you to all the uh, team, Georgia, and yeah, it's been it's been really it's been absolute pleasure, and I'm glad it ran for so long. <laughs> um, I'm glad it got stuck there. Uh, it has been a really great run, and yeah, I'd like to thank the team actually as well because actually I wasn't around for install, so I was on maternity leave. So thank you to yeah. Helen and Mel and everyone who saw through the exhibition install. And I'm really pleased that when I came back, I got to kind of uh, have the show still. So that has been the benefit of um, 2020's extraordinary times. Yeah, thanks to Helen too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, I think, yeah, well, Klaus, it just leaves me to say thank you so much for your time today, on a Sunday as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, Klaus, you're in Dubai at the moment, aren't you, Klaus? So, yeah, so it's a work day here. So yeah. Friday, Saturday is off, today is a work day. <laughs> so it's fine. I should thank you for coming on Sunday. <laughs> it's quite a nice time to do an in-conversation, actually. And it's also, um, you know, obviously we're doing it at this time of day because of, or the time difference between us so to try and make it like a reasonable hour um for taos so thank you so much for, for joining us um so yes um if you're able to do a, an audience survey uh, we'd be extremely grateful um please follow the link in the description to complete a survey it's really useful for us it helps us uh, develop uh, not only our digital program, but our program in general. Um, your feedback is most welcome and uh, really useful for us. Um, also, um, if you are able to donate, that's fantastic. So um, we're just doing these talks as pay as you feel or pay as you're able. Um, uh, any donations that you make are extremely welcome at this time. Um, I'm sure uh, everyone knows it's an extremely challenging time for arts organisations everywhere. Um, and yeah, your support is incredibly welcome at this time. So thank you for that. Um, and yes, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. And thank you so much, Taos, for doing um, a fantastic in conversation. And thank you, Georgia, behind the scenes, uh, making all the technical things working. So thank you so much. And goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>